Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, Casting Corner. I am here with Gary Zuckerbrod, the head casting director. Uh, just a reminder, this channel is me interviewing different casting directors from a casting director and an actor's perspective for you guys. And if you uh, if you like the videos, please you know share, subscribe, like, in the comment, tell me in the comments below. If there's something you want to know specifically for Gary, leave me a comment and I can maybe do a follow up with him. Sure. Why don't you tell me a little bit about how you got into casting, your background. I'm originally from New York. I grew up 30 minutes outside of Manhattan. I was really lucky. My parents took us to a lot of cultural things in Manhattan. And I saw my first Broadway show when I was nine years old, uh, which was the original cast of 1776, and didn't stop after that. By the time I was a little bit older, my older brother and I would take the Royal and Rowing to the city, and we'd get two furs, which were two tickets in the balcony for $4. And we saw everything, and I never stopped. I still go back to New York at least once, twice a year, and see shows there. I see theater here. Um, I got into casting in 1982. I was working in retailing, and I hated it. A friend of my dad's introduced me to Bonnie Tierman, and I ended up working for her for almost three years. And after that, I got a job as a freelance casting associate, working on a movie called To Live and Die in L.A., which was shooting in Los Angeles, but casting its leads in New York, which was very common at that time. And they brought me out to Los Angeles, and I was kept out here for five months. And the day that I was leaving, my boss got a job out here on the new Twilight Zone series. And two months into it, he split and went back to New York, and they made me the casting director. What? And that's how I became a casting director. But it was great. If you go back and look at the early Twilight Zone series from the 1980s, you will see people on that show that you won't believe. Like, I bumped into Bruce Willis one day. He used to be a bartender at Cafe Central in New York, and I saw him all the time. He was always in our office, and I bumped into him on the street out here um, in Beverly Hills, and I said, Bruce, what are you doing out here? And he went, I don't know, Gary, I'm doing this pilot with Sybil Shepherd. Who's going to go watch that? And I said, hey, I've got a Twilight Zone episode. Wes Craven's directing it. It's a two-hander. You get to play the good and evil side of yourself. And he said, great. I said, come in and meet Wes Craven tomorrow. And he did, and he got it. And he was on the cover of Box Set, which sold a lot of videotapes at that time. What, so, what are those? Uh, so uh, that was like an amazing job. And after that, I just started working. I was, uh, for a short period of time, I was an executive at CBS overseeing movies and miniseries. Cool. Awesome. Wait, let's talk a little bit about being an executive at CBS. What's it like on the executive side? <laughs> it was very nice. It was a lovely department. One of my closest friends, Lisa Clarenberg, I oversaw the minis and movies. CBS had two movie nights a week, Sunday and Tuesday. Mini series probably on four times a year. We were doing 72 to 75 projects a year because we were banking so much for the next season. That, that was a big business at that time. By 2000, the year 2000 had died for, for a number of reasons. The whole idea of the movie of the week business was based on getting a big television star into the lead that we could promote not only in the United States, but since U.S. television at that time was the dominant force across the world, these mini these movies sold quite well throughout the world. And then it started changing. You couldn't get TV stars to do the movies because they didn't want to do movie of the weeks. They wanted to do movies in theaters. movie theaters. Yeah. And that really was prompted by the success of the cast on ER. And... Um, I'll never forget, we had one movie of the week. It was uh, it was a, um, a Neil Simon play. We had Woody Allen star, and we couldn't get the female lead. And we had offered her to all these television stars, and we just we couldn't get the female lead. And I like begged and screamed and said, there's this actress, Sarah Jessica Parker, who's, who's really good, <laughs> and she ended up doing it. And then a year later, she ended up doing something for HBO. So, yeah. Um, but that's, that was what it was like to be an executive. For me, it was interesting, but it wasn't creative. I love working with actors. Yeah. And I love directing them and helping them find a role. That was so much more exciting to me yeah. than being an executive, being a police person between the actual casting director and the studio manager. Right. Since you've been doing this for a while... Um, <laughs> how casting has changed from when you started to now, yeah, and sure. what cat where casting is going. It's changing rapidly. 
I, I once did a panel at the Screen Actors Guild. There's three casting directors, and they introduced the first two and moderated the panel, say, and now our oldest casting director. <laughs> and so I sat down and, I, and he said, can you tell us how casting has changed? And I said, sure. When I first started in casting, I used to read actors in Greek. <laughs> in, in reality, here's how much casting has changed. When I first started, there wasn't videotape. It was in its infancy, and it didn't exist yet to a point where it could be used on a daily basis for casting. We were doing Miami Vice. We were we were casting the guest stars in New York, and the writer producers were in Los Angeles, and the producers were in Miami. We had to figure out a system of how the producers could see those auditions, and then and we got a the Universal supplied us with a videotape camera. It was about that big. It's hard to watching myself do this. It was about <laughs> that big and I had a cutout with a pad and it sat on my shoulder and went over this way and I read with the actors with it sitting on my shoulder. And it really wasn't that heavy. But most of the actors, none of them had ever seen a video camera like that before. They had seen you know, home movie cameras or they were brought in for screen tests. I mean, we used to screen test people until we did movies. We rented out a studio and the director was there and Lighting technician, makeup. They so put makeup on them? Not for videotaping, but when you did a screen test, shot uh, yeah. for a movie. No, don't um, do that anymore. No, they don't. Well, the cameras are so much yeah, that's better. True. So this machine, I would tape the actors, and upstairs at Universal, there was a half-inch video machine that it duped the tapes in half time. I would have to make one for us, make one for California, and one for Florida. And then I'd run down to oh FedEx, God. catch the last FedEx going out to the West Coast, and then I'd go see a show. <laughs> and then after a show, I'd go out for dinner, and then after dinner, I'd go to some performance piece or a comedy show. And that was my sort of life in casting. If there's been a major, major game changer in casting, it has been the use of recording actors. These days, you don't have a producer in the room with you. You don't have a director in the room with you. Right. Um, I did a great series called Without a Trace. And it was great yeah. because it had amazing roles for actors. It was all guest star based, and, and the roles were incredible. We got wonderful actors to be on it. And it was a great place for new actors who didn't have a lot on their resume to come out and do a role that had some meat to it. And we would still tape actors, but we'd have the producer and director in the room. Would it be like you see somebody first and then bring them back to producers, or everybody? No, would no, just no. Put the we would tape them, and we had a producer in the room, and we had the director, and the three of us would make up decide which choices we wanted to send. We would pick like two, possibly three choices, and send those around to the other three for the executive producers, yeah. and then they'd pick one. How many people would you see? So it would be a lot of people. We were shooting here in LA. Each episode had eight to 15 roles. In it. How many people would you see per role, roughly? Roughly seven was about a good number, depending on, unless it was a specialty Right. Part. right. Somebody once asked me what was one of the strangest roles that you've ever cast. When I was doing The Last Ship, we had a season where we were completely in Asia. I actually got a very funny call once from the casting department at TNT that we weren't having enough diversity in the season. My partner, Mara, and I looked at each other and said, hmm. So we called the casting people who we were very close with, and we said, so you mean we haven't cast enough white people this season? <laughs> she said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, in the last four episodes, everybody that we've cast has either been Vietnamese, Taiwanese, Japanese, or Polynesian. She went, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another major factor, is that we are much more conscious of diverse casting. And not only ethnically diverse, but diverse in terms of people with disabilities. Disabilities, yeah. Age. Age. There's a lot more consideration for that. If I got a script today for a role I was casting on, series there were three four guest star roles written as white i would call the producers up and say this unless there was a specific like it was a family i would say look we, we want to have more diversity here in the room right and that's that's very conscious so there are a lot more people weighing in how it's changed there are a lot more people weighing in we have a much more access to actors because we can see more we can either read them ourselves i have a book sessions, but a lot of offices have associates for doing the readings, and then the casting director just watches them. You like to read with the actors? I love to read with actors. Yeah, I really enjoy it. And I don't want to be the best actor in the world, but <laughs> I really enjoy reading with 
actors, it gives me insight into what they're doing. It helps me give them direction. But one of the things that I've noticed lately is actors' preparation in. There seems to be a little less of it. Maybe because there's more volume. It still requires an actor being very knowledgeable. And there are a couple of things that I always talk about, especially if I teach. When you get an audition and you go into that audition, even if it's somebody else, not the cast you have to take, if it's a television series that's been on and you haven't watched an episode of it, you are immediately behind eight ball. You are immediately one step down because every single television series has its own rhythms, its own tone, both physically. In other words, you notice that the lighting on one show is different than the lighting over the course of the series. It's different. If you watch the CSI shows, you would have noticed that Miami had an orangish red, CSI Miami, and CSI had a sort of greenish, blackish tone to it. And CSI New York had a sort of bluish tone to it. It's not by chance. That's very, very calculated. The actors who inhabit that show, they create a rhythm of how it works. The writing tends to then go along with that rhythm, or there's a rhythm that's created, like in an Aaron Sorkin show, where it moves quickly. And so if you're going to walk into an audition and you've got a lot of words on that page and you're going to speak slowly and kind of deliberately like this, that probably, unless it is stated, that probably is not going to match the rhythm of how everybody else is talking in that show. Right. And you have to be conscious of that when you walk in. Okay, so for a show that's on the air, if they're going in for it, they should definitely watch an episode. You should watch an episode if it's a new show. Yeah, if it's a and, pilot and there's nothing And there's to watch. nothing there. Look up the creators. See what they've worked on before. See what they've done before. Chances are it'll be similar. It may be similar. If you read the material and you look at what they've done, it may be totally different. Then you just have to use your best judgment. If they come in for a pilot, is it okay to ask, like, what is the tone of this show? Yeah, generally the casting office won't know what the tone of the show is unless they've had very in-depth discussions with the producers. Uh, that's not true. Actually, you do know. You get a, <laughs> you get a sense of it. Gotcha. You know, we... We get a sense of it. We read it. If the producers have callback sessions and they work with the actors, it helps us get a sense of what we're looking for. And to go back, so what do you see as the future of casting? The, the process or like... The process? Who knows? I mean, I'm not... Do you see it moving towards more like everyone self-taping? Do you see it? I think that there's going to be a lot more self-taping just because there's a lot more product. Yeah. And there's only a certain amount of us. Right. And we're not necessarily growing in numbers as a field. We're actually shrinking a little bit. And that's because what you're going to see, the difference is what you'll see are casting offices like Bernie Telsey's and Bialy Thomas and UDK, which are going to sort of expand. And that's how casting sort of was originally. There were fewer offices and people didn't know of it. It was a very different science in casting when casting first started. 50s. You're going to see bigger offices doing a lot more of the work. You're going to see a lot more uh, self-taping because we're going to have to go through more people. Los Angeles is the largest market for English-speaking actors in the world. New York is probably second. London's probably third. Or London may be second and New York third. And then Australia and New Zealand. If you're here in Los Angeles, you're competing in the most competitive market in the world actors. I just realized we were not centered this whole time. It's okay. They, they got more of me than you. So they got yeah. all, got all, yeah, well, all they want to say. They don't want, they don't want any of me. Um, so, okay. In terms of, like, diversity, you said, like, if you have, like, four roles and they're all Caucasian, you call your producers and, you know, say, you need more diversity. If, if the roles are open, would you see, like, disabled people and, uh, like, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, I think I know where you're going. With. Yeah. If, if there's no definition of what the role is, yeah. I, I wouldn't just do it off the bat. I would send an email to the producers and say, hey, are you open to diversity here? You know, we have a doctor in a hospital. Could that doctor be in a wheelchair? Right. Or is that going to hurt someone? Script-wise. Yeah, we could do that. You think casting is more open to that? Oh, I, yeah. yeah. 100%. Because there was somebody, I forget who, but somebody asked me about this. So I'm trying to incorporate this question in. It's more satisfying for us creatively. It's more satisfying Right. It's a more realistic depiction of the world we live in. Right. You look at a television show from the 1980s. Yeah, back then. Back, back when 
Yes. The sun has yes. Dracker chiseled, yes. <laughs> um, chiseled the sides in stone. Nice spoken Greek. Yes. Chiseled the sides in stone. You'll see episode after episode where there isn't a guest star who's not a finisher. Right. That's that's not the way Loki does it. Right. I had more questions and I forgot them. Um, You're not going to get the part. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Let's talk. Is there striking differences between how you cast a TV show versus, like, let, let's say let's say a pilot versus a movie? Yes and no. Okay. So, um, pilot, you're casting ten weeks. A movie, you're usually casting ten to twelve weeks, depending on the level of the movie. You can either get a, a better known, mm-hmm. more famous name in it, depending. I mean, I just passed a billboard. There's a Netflix show with Meryl Streep and Gary Oldman, and Paul Rudd playing two two sides of himself. Hmm. Which I can't wait to see. Yeah. He's such a great actor. Sounds fun. And really one of the nicest people you've ever met. Yeah, I mean, the crossover is so, so vast today. On a movie, it's a one shot. You're looking to create an encapsulated world, unless it's a serial movie. You're, you know, and it's like the Marvel movies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And on television, you're looking to cast people for the life of a series. Right. And Can they hold a series? Are they well, interested? Yeah, I mean... Well, not just actors. Yeah. yeah, can they... If the stars, can they support a series? Can they launch it? Can they... But also, you watch actors grow into those roles right. over the course of them. If you watch a series... Take The Walking Dead. Take Andrew Lincoln. If you watch his growth over the course of that series as an actor, it's pretty fantastic. And he was a very nice actor when he started the series. But he's really shown depth of range over the course of that series if you watch that. And then they start writing for your scripts. Right. The producers get to know you, you get to know them, and they start writing for all those things that an actor can do. Brian Cranston, we all knew he was a great dramatic actor, but he had only been comedies in terms of television. And then he does this dramatic role that's one of the greatest dramatic roles ever written. Do you see different actors for movies versus pilots? Like Yes, it depends on the level of the movie. So tentpole movies are like Disney creating a franchise. You want those names that are going to sell that franchise around the world and know that when it opens up in China, it's going to make more money than it's going to make now in this territory. But even when you're doing a small independent film these days, you're looking at these formulas that are sort of calculated by people who crunch numbers. Foreign value. And it's by which territory we can sell that name in this territory, this territory, this territory, and we can sell this name in this territory, and this territory. So if you put those two names together, they sell in 17 different territories or eight territories. So yeah, that is is looked at. And what about for like, so let's say not the leads, but like the supporting roles or the smaller roles, where it doesn't have to be a name in that particular No, then you're just trying to cast the best actors. You know what the hardest thing about our business is for everybody? There's no formulas to it. It's Tuesday, I'm casting yellow and blue. Wednesday, I'm casting orange and purple. Monday, I'm working on a comedy, and Tuesday, I'm working on a heavy drama. There isn't a formula to right. it. You know, as a casting director, because we have to, especially when you're on a series, you know, every six, eight days, you're doing, a new thing. doing something completely different. Yeah. We're kind of used to change. Right. And I, I, I talk about that a lot when I teach, that you, you have to be very open-minded when you're coming in for an audition. You have to prepare. You have to do your research. If you are wedded to that audition in the way that you're doing it, and you don't listen and you're not open to having a director or a casting director tell you, well, that was very nice, but why don't we try it slower? Let's put a little bit more heart. Let's get it out of your head a little bit. Let's bring out the emotion. And if you can't change with those directions, you have to look at yourself and your actor and say, okay, how do I adjust my tools as an actor to be able to change when somebody tells me a direction? And I see this all the time because I've got a great viewing suit. If my director is sitting behind me and the tape person's behind me and I'm facing the actor and I'm listening to what the director is saying, I'm watching the actor go like this, and I know it's going right over there. I can see it in their eyes because they're just familiar. Right. You have to open up your mind. You have to listen. Because ultimately, when you're acting with another actor, you have to be 100% present with that person. The way that you and I are talking right now. Right. We're looking at each other. We're reacting to each other's body language. We're reacting to each other's eyes. And reacting to what we say to each other. That's what we do. That's the business plan. I'm speaking so fast. Do you take notes? <laughs> you can watch it again. And watch it again. And watch it again. I'm, and watch I'm it speaking just back in my uh, We're going to be right back. 